I started my little picky comments, which just weren't appropriate. I mean, end of the day, people are tired. They've been getting after it. And I just, I didn't realize it. I had no awareness at all. And Rick stood up from planting the flowers with the tools in his hands and he dropped them. And he just looked at me and he said, I quit. And he turned around and he walked away. You're listening to the Profit by Design podcast, episode 24. You work hard in your business. On the Profit by Design podcast, we ask the big question. What has your business done for you lately? Hi, I'm Dr. Sabrina Starling, the business psychologist, the author of How to Hire the Best, and your co-host on the Profit by Design podcast. Weekly, my co-host, Mike Bruno, and I bring you tips, tools, and strategies from our own experiences and from the experiences of our guests, who are entrepreneurial thought leaders and real-life entrepreneurs, all to support you in making intentionally profitable and sustainable business decisions to live the lifestyle you desire. Hey, profit designers, are you dreaming of a four-week vacation? If so, it's time to stop dreaming and start putting things into motion to make it happen. I've created a four-week vacation jumpstart guide to help you with just that. Head on over to fourweekvacation.com and get your free jumpstart guide. And while you're there, be sure to check out our four-week vacation retreat that's coming up in just a few weeks. Last year, I issued the four-week vacation challenge to our participants. Most of them took me up on that challenge and they're returning this year. Six of us have taken our four week vacations already and the rest are taking theirs in the next 12 to 18 months. The upcoming retreat has filled. If you wanna get your name on the waiting list for 2020, be sure to get your application in now. All of that is available at fourweekvacation.com. Hey, Profit Designers. On today's episode, we have a very special guest with us who I'm really excited to introduce to you. I've been following his work now since I've learned about him for about a year, and I'm absolutely intrigued by what he is up to. His name is Jeff McManus, and he's written the book, Growing Weeders into Leaders. And I'll just give you a little snippet of why I am so intrigued by what he's up to. And it's because at Tap the Potential, we work with small business owners to create a great place to work. And getting your team engaged in creating your workplace culture is a big part of being successful in creating a great culture. And so I have been studying what do you do to get your team engaged. And in the last couple of years, we have been offering leadership boot camp for our clients to take their team members through to help the team members learn about the culture of a small business and what it really means to work in a small business and how important their role is just to kind of educate them about what's expected from them. Well, Jeff has done something very similar with his program, Landscape University at Old Miss. And so on today's episode, we're going to get into everything that he has learned about leadership and how he now helps organizations grow leaders from Weeders, which is his landscape crew that he has there. So before we go into the interview, I want to give a couple of shout outs and share a couple of fun things with you. So If you haven't listened to the last two episodes on the Profit by Design podcast, I really encourage you to go back and listen. In episode 23, Mike and I talked in depth about how do we as business owners overcome our own resistance to change, and we also talked about helping team members overcome resistance to change. Now, in the episode before that, we interviewed Vicki Suter on the book Profit Bleed, and since Since then, I know I've heard from several of you that you have bought the book, you've read the book, you're starting to implement some of the things that you've learned from Vicki. That's been a very impactful episode. So if you're listening to this and you haven't listened to those other two episodes, you're definitely going to want to check those out. 
And we have a couple of new members in the Profit by Design podcast Facebook group. We're excited when we have new members joining us over there. The Facebook group is a great place to continue the conversation after our episodes. We love our profit designers to share input with us. So I want to welcome Tim Kurz. And Tim Kurz, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name because I'm afraid I would butcher it. But welcome, Tim Kurz. And I also want to welcome Cynthia Ellington. And Tim Kurz, I believe you invited Cynthia to join us. So we really love it when you all share the podcast with a friend. That's what we're all about here and spreading the word about designing a profitable and sustainable business that supports your lifestyle. And we want to share that with more business owners out there. So thank you for helping us with that, Tim Kurz. And I also want to let you all know we are coming up on episode 25 and Mike and I are doing a special drawing. If you will leave us an honest review on whatever platform you listen to Profit by Design on, whether it's iTunes or Stitcher, leave us an honest review. And then because we may not notice the review because there's all kinds of different platforms that we're out there on, what I would like you to do is take a screenshot of the review and email it to us at Sabrina and Mike at Profit by Design Podcast.com. We will be doing a drawing on episode 25 and giving away a copy of the pumpkin plan. Episode six, where I interviewed Donna Lyons about the business sweet spot has been one of our most popular episodes. And that one is all about the pumpkin plan. So Mike and I decided we want to take one of our most popular episodes and really do it up. And so we're going to give away a copy of the pumpkin plan to one of you who leaves us an honest review. Those reviews are really important for us because they help us get discovered by other listeners. And we're trying to grow the audience and share more of the profit by design strategy with more small business owners. So I hope if you found this podcast valuable over the last 24, 25 episodes, please leave us an honest review. So let's get down to business. I want to introduce our guest, Jeff McManus, to you. At the age of 37, the University of Mississippi hired Jeff McManus as the director of the newly formed Landscape Services Department. At his age, and at that time, Jeff was one of the most junior directors on campus. The immediate challenges that faced him were staggering, exceptionally low morale with an unacceptable lack of productivity. I'm thinking some of you can relate to these challenges in your business. In many ways, the Ole Miss Landscape Services was actually an extreme example of the same problems facing many organizations then and today. Jeff supposed the solution to these staggering problems was to establish a four-step process that he calls the GROW system. So he works from the position that everybody wants to be successful, and they can be, by recognizing their personal potential. Through greatness, resiliency, opportunity, and wisdom, these four things form Jeff's GROW system. At the core of this leadership approach on campus was the process of engaging the hearts, minds, and passions of the workers, and then replacing the command and control style of leadership with a confident, credible growth culture. The most important thing a leader can do is to give every employee ownership of the organization's success. According to McManus, the GROW system is a practice that allows every team member to share the responsibility for success through achieving five-star performances every day. It was this consistent, best-of-the-best attitude that led Jeff's team to their first national championship in campus beauty, the PGMS Green Star Award. Regarded as the most beautiful campus in America, Ole Miss Landscape Services has won five national championships in landscape beautification from USA Today, Princeton Review, Newsweek, and two from the Professional Grounds Management Society. Jeff has been featured in Forbes, Facilities Executive, Huffington Post, and countless other outlets for his book, Growing Weeders into Leaders. So let's dive in. All right. So, Jeff, I'm so eager to talk with you about turning weeders into leaders and all of your experiences that you have had, particularly with blue collar workers and entry level positions and how you cultivate them into leaders in your organization. So, Let's take folks back to the beginning before you wrote your book, Growing Weeders into Leaders, and your experiences that led you to write the book. Because I know once you got hired, 
you had a lot of rough experiences with your team. It didn't start smoothly. So maybe if you take us there. Yeah, well, you know, we've all, when you get out of college, you think you know everything, right? And then you realize you got to lead people because you're really not successful unless you can get things done with your team. And so that became the real challenge for me was to get people to buy into what I was doing and what we needed to do as an organization. There was all the challenges and then there was the challenges of, you know, raising our standard and all that that happened with that. But I learned some hard lessons, you know, right away, I ran into a really experienced guy named Rick on our team. And Rick was just, he was the gentle giant. He loved everybody. Everybody loved Rick. Been with the company for over 10 years. He was the guy. We were a contractor on a big major resort. And the resort people loved Rick. They trusted him. And here I came as the new project manager. I became Rick's boss. And I really didn't know how to lead somebody, especially somebody older than me that was more experienced than me. And so in my mind, I thought I needed to kind of criticize Rick from time to time so that he gets better, right? That just makes sense. If I criticize him or point out his faults, he'll want to get better. It just seems so logical. And (laughs) well, little did I know that I was really just putting daggers in his back and, you know, punching him in the gut, so to speak. And one day he asked me to comment on a big flower bed that they had just planted. And it was huge. It was beautiful, gorgeous. And they'd spent a lot of time on it. And I told them as such, you know, I had a great job. But then I started my little picky comments, which just weren't appropriate. I mean, end of the day, people are tired. They've been getting after it. And I just, I didn't realize it. I had no awareness at all. And Rick stood up from planting the flowers with the tools in his hands and he dropped them. And he just looked at me and he said, I quit. And he turned around and he walked away. And, you know, my ego was like, hey, I'm not chasing after this guy, right? And all that. But really, in real terms, I needed Rick because he was, he brought so much value to the organization. I had to have the awareness of what my role was. And fortunately for me, Rick and I had a sit down conversation the next day. He had rested and he was able to tell me, hey, Jeff, your words really do matter. You know, you are the boss. We realize you're young. You just come into the organization, but still the way you talk to us and how you talk to us really affects us and our mood. So it was eye opening. I mean, it was a huge disaster. Thankfully, Rick, we got him back on the team and and things worked out, but I learned a lot that day. Wow. So I have to just acknowledge you because you're coachable. And we were talking on the Profit by Design podcast, we talk a lot about is someone coachable on your team? And that ability to learn from mistakes and being open to feedback. I know that took a lot of, you know, putting the ego in check to sit and listen to what he had to say and then be willing to course correct. But really look at where that's taken you now and the impact that you're having on developing leaders because of that conversation. Like that was the seed, right? Right. Coachability is huge. I mean, that coachability, do they have awareness? Are they willing to see that when somebody points out? It's not a matter if you have a blind spot, right? It's a matter if you can accept it and then work on that. So, and then who do you hear that feedback from? Is it just your boss? Because if you've been doing this for very long, you know, you can fool your boss but you can't fool the people who work with you. And so do you ever ask for feedback like a 360, you know, the people who work for you, the people who work beside you, as well as your boss. So that's, I found that to be valuable. That's been some of the best feedback I've gotten is from those who answer to me. Absolutely. Yeah. What a good insight. So one of the things that really caught me right away when I started reading the book is that When you took your role at Old Miss, the team was reduced by seven people? Yeah. Well, we voluntarily, as we began to start our system and work through things, we, you know, new leadership, I was the new leader, we were losing people because, hey, I don't, this guy's holding us accountable and and those kind of things. And it's just not the same anymore and and those kind of things. And, but that we were getting better, right? We were getting more efficient. People were starting to lean into our philosophy of all the things about, we could be a great university. We could be one of the best in the country. We could be like Disney is to the resort world. We could be to the universities. And so we were talking a lot about national 
championships and doing big things, but we reduced, we started dropping numbers and I wasn't hiring back because I saw we went from mowing from 10 days down to mowing for five days. And then we've eventually gotten that down to four, three and a half and so forth. But it was our staff that was beginning to buy in and take ownership was a big part of that. So let's go into a little more detail around that because our listeners, not everyone is in landscape who listens to the Profit by Design podcast. So, and not everyone is familiar with the campus of Ole Miss. It's huge, right? Yeah. Thousand acres. Should we die? That's, that's huge. Yeah, big yard. So when you say ten days to mow, and you started working on efficiency, what were some of the things that you were paying attention to that you needed to make more efficient? And then from that, how did you get the team to start focusing on that? You're one of the few people who's really who's ever picked up on that. So that's really. It's fairly insightful because it was a multi-pronged approach because one is we got it by him. We started listening to our staff and talking to them, but we're saying, hey, how can this be easier on you guys? And so when they're driving their mowers around, they have these big bars over the top of them. They're called rot bars, rollover protection, right? That In case their mower tips over on a big commercial mower, they are not crushed. But these bars hit tree limbs if the tree limbs are low. So that was one of the feedbacks is, these limbs are, you know, they're hitting us in the face. And, and it's like, if we could fix that, that would be a huge aspect. We're spending a lot of time weed eating around trash cans. We're having to back up our mowers and turn around and it's cost. We're losing a lot of time. And so what we started doing is empowering them to change the bed lines, to change it so the turf beds swept around so they didn't have to back up. And it's a little bit nerdy, but, you know, we took out the 90 degree turns that a mower can't make you know mower has to go in forward and then back up and you when you start systematizing that way where the mowers are moving forward all day long it's amazing how much quicker you can move and you take out the weed eating uh, the line trimmers that have to go around and weed eat around all the objects whether they're picnic tables or just little things like that we our staff started having that eye for detail started seeing that but then as they felt confident and empowered they knew they could make those changes without talking to me, right? We empowered them with the $100 decisions, the $500 decisions. And and if that's keep moving up now, I think we're probably at a $2,000 decision now where they can empower to do without having to talk to Jeff because we have that trust going on. We know they're going to do it the right way or do it a good way. So you were reduced by doing that. You reduced the mowing time down from 10 days to what? Well, we got it down originally to about five days. And actually, you know, you and I didn't talk about this, but I have a PDF that I have the 30 ways that we used to decrease mowing. So if you got any mowing guys out there that want that, I'll be happy to provide that for them. I want it. So the reason I picked up on this is a little background. I have a six acre yard, essentially. I'm the one who does the mowing with the commercial mower who has the roll bar. I'm the one who goes to the neighbor and says, hey, your pecan trees are getting some of those little shoots. And if we don't cut them now, I'm not going to be able to mow (laughs) under those pecan trees. So I love mowing. It's like, it's a sickness, I guess. That's how I relieve stress. It's therapy. But it's therapy. But, you know, from a business standpoint, What I'm really tuned into is that when we can create more and more efficiency, especially in a small business, and it's the people who are on the ground, who are doing the work day to day, who have the best insights into where can we be more efficient. We as the leaders don't always see it because we're not out there doing it every day. And when you can change, when you can cut your mowing time in half, from 10 days to five days, the amount of savings that efficiency brings in is tremendous. So I know every business owner listening to this, you have inefficiency in your business. And if you talk to your team members and you say, where are our inefficiencies? Where are things taking you too long to get done? Or what's blocking your path? You'll get this feedback. People will tell you, they want to tell you, they're so relieved that you're asking and that you want to help them get the obstacles out of the way. You're right on. I mean, I'm just sitting here listening to you. You're so spot on. Of course, I'm working here at a university and what happened for us is we built the trust. If you may have heard that little whoosh, I sent you the document, so you'll have it. Thank you. I need that for my yard. (laughs) You know, that's, 
you're building trust or you're saving money and you're getting, I mean, we have staff back up our people, but it was years later. Our bosses saw, oh my goodness, they're doing more with less. They're saving money, but yet they're getting even more done. I'll tell you another little thing we did. It's just silly, but on college campuses, we have bollards and chains to keep people from walking through turf areas and things like that. And we had so many of those. We had over three miles of those that we had to weed eat around each one of them. Well, it's at least a 10 to 11 seconds every time you do that, 30 times a year. That's a lot of time. So we started putting those in concrete. So it, they became, we attached them to the sidewalks. So we extended the sidewalks out and got those bollards put in there. So we didn't have to weed it around those pipes. We just ran an edger down the side of the sidewalk now that was extended out. That just saves so much time. And then what's exciting even more than that is when the staff comes in and they go, hey, we can save a lot of time when we move this concrete out. We can do that this winter when we're not mowing, we can extend this out. And it cost a little money, it was a little investment in sack creed and doing it, but boy, man, that was 15 years ago that we've recovered that savings quickly on that. And that's those little changes they trickle down all across the years. And so they really add up. The other thing that I picked up on in the book is that really impressed me is that when your team was reduced by those seven team members, you asked to use the funds to increase the compensation for those who remained on the team and you used it to buy uniforms and anything that made labor more expeditious and really eased the burden, so to speak. So what I see in that is you saw you have a core team and if you can nurture that core team and put those resources towards taking care of them, you're going to get increased efficiency. I totally agree. That's invest in those who are investing in you, right? And so we turned around and reused that for them, whether it be uniforms, which was a big deal. We changed our uniforms to a really, to a Carhartt uniform, which is a higher grade than what we're doing. They felt better. They felt valued. They look good. But, you know, a guy much rather wear a pair of Carhartts because that's just cool. Right? It's got the cool factor, but they cost more. And so they're not the cheapest, but then the savings came because we didn't have to laundry them, you know, put them in the laundry. They took them home and did, took care of themselves. And so it's, they felt that, Hey man, there's pride in here. We wear this. And then the kind of the silly side story on that is when people see them now in Walmart and they got their name across there, what they do, Ole Miss Landscape Services, people are like, hey, can I ask you some questions about my yard? You know, and so they're like, oh, the wow. experts. yeah, so they're the local expert hero rock star at the grocery store. So we love that. That is fantastic. I mean, just the feeling of pride that goes yeah. into that. So the reason I picked up on that is because we work with a lot of small business owners on developing the culture in their business. And we talk about identifying the core values, the immutable laws. And there's something that happens once those immutable laws get clarified. You see the people who are on your team who are the right people. It's suddenly very clear. And then it's also very clear who's not a good for the team. So there is a natural turnover that happens and it's a bit of a bumpy ride. And what I think is the opportunity in that is that now you have the funds freed up to invest in your best team members and start to grow and develop them. Because in my experience, and you might have this experience too, you see those best team members rally together. Now that they're not having to deal with the people who are not as engaged, not as excited about the work, they start to pull together and get it done. I do. We have 33 employees here just in the landscaping. So you have to rehire and the challenge becomes so with four or five new hires, you can begin to change again. And we experienced that. So we had what you're talking about. We had that drop and we had that core and we had that group. But as we hired back, we didn't hire back really well. And that was my fault. We didn't know how to hire. We never went through a hiring class. You know, it was just like, Y'all hire who you want to hire. And so what we had to do is educate ourselves on how to hire. And we started reading books from Chick-fil-A and how they look for top people to, to hire in their organization. And so that's really helped us to bring in people who have the same core beliefs that we do in the sense that they take that pride in what they do. What are some of those titles? Do you happen to remember those offhand? Because I know we have listeners who love to read on hiring. Well, yes. If I can look across here, let's see. Deanne Turner, 
she wrote, it's my pleasure. That by far is one of the best. Our leaders read that in our organization. and I mean, that book's marked up, highlighted, and we just took it apart because what questions can we put into our hiring process? One of the big takeaways that some of your listeners may enjoy is instead of just doing one and done, like one person talk to them, okay, you're hired, we have a committee. And so we bring in our frontline people. And then we not only do that once, but we do that twice. And so I'm on the second committee. I don't even come in until they've made it through the first. My role is, is to talk you out of the job. And we learned that with Chick-fil-A. They literally try to talk you out of being an owner operator. And that has worked really, really well. We've actually had people leave the interview and say, hey, this is just probably not the right job for me because we start talking about in my industry, like you're going to be working outside in the heat in Mississippi and it's going to be hot in the summertime. In August. Yeah, humid. And you know, we're not inside. And so we're, first, can you do that? Then can you weed eat all day long? Can you weed eat in that in poison ivy? Can you work around fire ants, mosquitoes, ticks? Okay. How about this? Okay, we're going to get a little bit even worse, but how about the dead squirrels and the dead deer and the dead dogs that are on the road that are cooking on the road that you've got to, you know, that's part of what we do is, and then are you excited yet? Do you want to come work with us? You know, and then, then I tell you about the garbage trucks that we drive and periodically we have to climb up in those garbage trucks. And it gets pretty graphic and there's pretty nasty. I mean, it's gross, but. I tell you, you had me. I was ready to sign on until you said the dead deer and the dogs in the road. See, and the we'd have weeded yeah. you out. You'd have weeded me out. That's totally it. I'm not your person. But that's exactly what you want to do is you want to inoculate the people. Because once someone has heard all of that graphically, like you expressed it in graphic detail, they are inoculated. And if they come to work and they experience those conditions and they've already said, yes, psychologically they have buy-in because they have told you, yeah, I can do that. That doesn't bother me. How would you feel, Sabrina, if I told you after you've worked so hard in your yard and you've got it looking immaculate that we bring over about 90 tons of waste and we dump it all across your six acres? Would that excite you? I'm out of here. Okay, so that's what happens after football season. Every game, we pick up between 60 to 90 tons of garbage out of our front yard, which is the grove after tailgating. And, you know, that's sometimes mentally, that does a number on you. You know, it definitely doesn't build morale when you see your work destroyed. So that's one of those things that takes a different type person to do what we do. And there's a pride in that because not everybody can do what we do, right? And so there's a lot of pride in that. So... I'm just really curious because my book, How to Hire the Best, it's all about how to attract the right people to your team. And I really love to help people zero in on what are the personality strengths that someone needs to do this job exceptionally well. What have you zeroed in? When you say it takes a special type, what strength or trait are you picking up on in your interviews? Well, I I just reached behind me and to pull off this because this is what our staff uses a lot. I know your listeners who are just listening can't see this, but it's our landscape creed. And this was basically our core values for a lot of things that are important to us that our staff came up with. And so when you ask me what's important, the number one thing is lead by example. You know, are you willing to jump in the trenches and get your hands dirty? no matter how many years you've been there, right? Included, this is for Jeff McManus, I'm picking up trash every day. And so it's not somebody else's job, it's our job. And then two, adapt and overcome. Can you adapt and overcome? Because you're gonna get what we call a zinger every day. You're gonna get something unexpected thrown at you. Does it become a drama, you know, drama thing for you? Or do you, can you process it and get it done? Never stop training and growing. That's our values is that we're always looking for ways, which ties into a lot of our landscape university type things that we do. But yeah, these are probably some of our top qualities that we're looking for core values in other people. And what's fun is to watch our staff because we have this posted up where we do interviews in a big board and our staff will look up there and they'll say, tell me, read that and tell us what that means to you because they want to know if that person believes how they believe in those core values. Yeah. Well, and do you watch body language when you're talking about, when you're sharing these stories and watching 
when you share your creed? I need to read your book. I just wrote your title of your book and I'm getting your book because if you have some insights on that, I'm going to learn from you on that. I tell you what, what's really interesting to me is when you are sharing those core values in an interview and telling stories about them. So, you know, just telling a story about, you know, you've got your yard looking all beautiful and then somebody comes and dumps 90 tons of trash. That's very graphic. It's a great story. And if you watch the body language of somebody, you'll see like closed posture and all of a sudden like pulling back or eyebrows furrowing. And, you know, those are signals that I'm disengaging from this story now. <laughs> this is too much. Okay, I don't want to visualize the 90 tons of trash on my lawn. And so it's that those nonverbal cues that really tell if somebody is a good fit with the core values. And I strongly believe that that is the filter if there's not a good fit with core values, it's the time to stop the interview. Like don't go any further because it's not going to end well. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, but I've not put a lot of value on that because I don't know how to do it. So. Well, hopefully this is helpful to you. And another resource that I want to throw out, you may have read it is the book who Yes. by Jeff smart. And I love that for the interview process. And I highly recommend that to our clients when they're, especially because we business owners are always looking for what's the best question to ask and who the book who details, not just the questions that you need to ask, but the why behind the questions. So, you know, psychologically what you're getting and what you need to tune into in the interview. I agree. We read that book as a leadership just for that. And tell me more, you know, that follow-up question and how I think it was one of the ones. So anyway, we put those three in that wall and so that we'll remember what those three follow-ups are. Tell me more, right? They say something and you learn a lot when you just say, tell me more. Yeah. And the, you know, if you ask it several times, that somebody is going to go deeper and deeper. And I love, you know, say, tell me more. And then just imagine the duct tape going over your mouth. So if you're quiet and you just listen, people will reveal themselves to you. You know, I'm a psychologist and this is what I learned having to deal with people and doing psychological evaluations. And I had to assess were they, you know, did they have any deviant side to them? And I thought, I found out very early on, if I just ask them questions, tell me more and listen, all the stuff comes out. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do it to you here on the Thanks. Internet. I'm getting a little nervous over here. That's for sure. <laughs> you notice I haven't told you tell me more like three times. That's yeah, when you yeah. get nervous when I say it. <laughs> Just going for the deep stuff. So let's go back into the, some things that you share in the book that I really, that struck me as very insightful in terms of growing leaders. First off, tell me, how did you get your team to start buying into a vision? I learned from my boss about casting vision and that people want to be a part of something bigger than themselves and that he had cast a vision for Ole Miss to become a great university. What did he call it? America's one of great, I forgot how it's, America's great universities. And the people laughed at that initially, but then when they got that status, you know, people weren't laughing anymore because he had needed to be big. And so we just talked about initially being the best of the best and Nobody pushed back on it. So I just kept saying it. Let's be the best of the best. Let's be the best. And then we talked about cultivating greatness as our vision of we, every day we want to create an incredible campus that will attract great minds, great people to this university who are going to do great things. They're going to go into space. They're going to play sports. They're going to cure HIV. They're going to write best novels like, you know, some of our alumni have. And so we're part of the recruiting process because we know 62% of prospective students will decide in the first few minutes if they're coming to the campus based on appearance. And a landscaping is a part of that. So we talked about our bigger picture. We're not just cutting grass and pulling weeds, but we're recruiting people who are changed the world. And so we just call that cultivating greatness. And we, it seemed to get good traction. The key was, is for me not to stop saying it and not to stop talking about it. And it's actually in our landscape creed. And so we say it every Monday morning after our meeting, we talk about cultivating greatness. Wow. Okay. So I love that because sometimes as leaders, I think we get busy and distracted and we think, well, I've said it a few times. They should have gotten it by now. They should hear it, but it's about hearing it over and over and over in different ways that really that's right stick. 
Yeah, and then having other people say it as well. So we'll bring in VIPs. For us, it's our football coaches, it's our professors, it's our chancellors. We find other people to tell us the same message, but they hear it differently because it's coming from a different from person. So when the head football coach shows up and says, you guys are extremely important to recruiting, our staff listens, they know, but wow, we have a small part to play in helping the football team, and that's a big deal. So trying to get other people to tell the same message. They may not say the word cultivating greatness the, or be the best of the best, but they talk about how valuable the landscaping team is to their organization. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other thing that I'm aware of is that when you have people on your crew, many of them are coming, they're not college educated necessarily, right? There are folks who might have a high school education and in growing weeders into leaders, you talk about that you have people from the different departments of the university come and give lectures and they sit in on the lectures. And I really love the part where you said, we role play before those professors come about what's going to happen and how to interact with those professors and how to go up and ask them questions afterwards and just connect because that's something I think that it's just like there's no training for that. They've never necessarily been exposed to those kinds of things. Well, you're right. I mean, how many times have, have you and I met the president of the United States, right? You've probably met the president a lot more than I have. I haven't met him or her yet, but you would hope somebody would tell us protocol before we do. And so a lot of our staff have never talked very much to a professor or someone who's making a lot of money. I learned this the hard way, by the way, is when you bring a VIP to your organization, you need to prep your people prior to and so that they're successful because I'll tell you a funny story, but one of our alumni came down who has given a tremendous amount of money to the beautification of the campus and he loves our team. And so he's, I just brought him down spur of the moment he was in town. He called me and I'm introducing him to some of our guys. And one of the first questions, the guy, one of my guys says is, Hey, how much money do you make? And I felt a little embarrassed, you know, because I'm like, that's really not the appropriate question to ask. So it was really eye opener for me. And I took responsibility for that. That was my fault. I didn't set him up for success. It gave us a great learning tool. And yeah, I want him to be successful. You know, becoming successful is a mindset, right? It's what you tell yourself every day. And a lot of times our, you find that those who are in the trap of not doing better, they're telling themselves they can't or they don't deserve it, or the little man never can get ahead, or whatever they're telling, it's not good. And so we work on that soundtrack for their head as well. But when their VIPs are coming in, you know, ask them, what kind of books are they reading? What do they attribute their success to? Who do they admire? You know, those are three good questions right there. But give them the tools that they need to be successful. Well, and just having some questions ahead of time, because, you know, you've done speaking and when you sit there, you've given a speech and then the audience has no questions. It's kind of like, huh, I don't know. Did they get it? Did I totally miss the boat? So just having your crew or your team with three questions that they could ask to get the conversation going. And I bet that's all it takes is a couple of questions to get the conversation rolling. And then it just kind of goes from there. And teaching them how to shake hands. I mean, it's crazy, but we do that. You know, we actually stand up, shake each other's hands, talk about how you look somebody in the eye. You don't try to take them down with a hard handshake or a dead fish in their hand and, you know, just talk through that. And everybody kind of laughs and, you know, but it really, it helps. When I taught a college class a couple of years ago and it was freshman orientation and we did that in freshman orientation, I just showed them, let's just talk about how to shake hands, go on an interview, what does it need to look like? And it's a little thing, but in the big picture, it, it makes a difference. Well, and I can relate to this on so many levels because when I was a college student, I had no idea my first year in college how to act. No one had prepped me for that. And so I kind of learned just by watching how nice it would have been to have somebody tell me a few pointers about, you know, here's what you need to do. And But then when I was in graduate school at the University of Texas in Austin, I had a teaching role and I was teaching a course, you'll love this, Transition to Adulthood. 
I don't think it was named real well, (laughs) but it was for college freshmen who were the first generation in their family to come to the university. And it was all the things they needed to know about how to conduct themselves and how to succeed because they weren't, they didn't have anyone else in their family who would be teaching them that because they're the first generation. And I know, and I want to go here, I want to talk about Landscape University because I think you're doing a lot of this through Landscape University. So can you share with our listeners what that's about and how you've built that program? Well, I needed a way to scale or to get consistency and our staff needed that as well. They were talking about the leadership on the team was talking about the frustration of, a person coming on the team and saying, hey, we do it like this on this side of campus, but y'all do it this way. And and so was, there were some challenges there when we brought new people on. We were losing the culture. And so what we started doing was developing, we just asked our staff, hey, what does the new person need to know? When they come on board here, you know, what are we about? And we just started getting input from our team. And we created these real simple, short, five to 10 minute classes that we could actually onboard people quickly, get them up to speed so that they're successful. They know what is expected of them. They know what a a successful employee looks like because that's one of our classes. Everything to little details to like, how do we operate, do our operations? Where do we put our keys? How do we communicate? All these kind of things are so simple and they're easy to do, but when you're new, you don't always know them. And so that along with working on our beliefs, we created a leader to leader class to where we actually work on developing our core values and keeping those intact so that we're watching whether it's TEDx video or a John Maxwell or Zig Ziglar, watching those and interacting and getting our team to talk. So my role in that is, is to get people to talk, is to, I'm the facilitator. It's amazing how that has unified us and created a culture of growth and excellence where people want to be really good at what they do and they want to be around those kind of people. So that's takes a little bit of investment in time, but it's like anything else you do, it compounds. So that compounds like 10x easy. We get that time back so fast because people are all leaning in and wanting to be a part of work instead of trying to find ways not to work. Well, I love what you're sharing because you asked your team what needed to be included. So you didn't necessarily create all the content in Landscape University by sitting down and thinking it through yourself. You went to your team and you asked them and you got their input and they thought about things that you wouldn't necessarily have come up with. But I also like that it's dripped in small doses because I know for myself and any time that I was a new employee, you get this you know blast from a fire hose of information coming at you within a three-day period, your first few days on the job, and it you can't remember all of it. And I think psychologically we learn best when we're dripped with little bits of information and helpful things. I like what you describe, like, where do you hang your keys? That's something that if somebody doesn't know that, it creates some inconvenience and discomfort for them. And why are all these gas cans painted different colors, you know, and why are the gas caps painted different colors and what do those mean? And I mean, it's funny when I came in here into the office, they were out there, our team was shooting some video because they're producing the next video to go into Landscape University because they had a problem with something. And anytime they have a problem now, I rarely hear it because they're empowered to create a class on it. And then I don't teach the classes, right? It's our leaders are teaching them, then our really good frontline people who are pretty, that don't mind teaching. Not everybody teaches, not everybody wants to, but they get CEUs, you know, continuing education units in the program when they teach. So they like doing that as well. So you're getting people to lean into the process. So you empower them. So we went from just everything on paper to now we have little classes in PowerPoint and now we have even videos. If you even go to our website, Ole Miss Landscaping website, you'll see a lot of our videos that we've created and everything from motivational videos to, you know, just kind of cool stuff that, you know, getting people to buy in. I mean, we, it's funny, but you ever see these little three minute videos with like Rocky doing all this stuff, you know, Balboa and these fighters and stuff. We just challenged one of our guys who's doing the videos. Like, why don't you create one of those, but put our landscaping guys in and he nailed it. I mean, it was awesome. You got all these 
motivational speakers talking and everything. And, and there's our team doing their stuff. You know, they're, they're working. Well, we showed it to the team. And the very first comment is, is that on YouTube? You know, because they wanted to show it to their families. They were proud of it because, you know, you got this inspiring music. You got all this cool stuff going on. And there they are doing their work. And they're part of the success part of it. And so, yeah, it's another one of those things how we're getting deeper beliefs into what we do. So after we're done, can you shoot me the link to that video? Oh, sure. We need to put sure. that in our show notes. Yeah, we that's have a listeners fun. who want to go check uh, that one out. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. Yeah. Now, the Landscape University videos where we do more training, those aren't on there. But if anybody ever comes to one of our conferences, we share that stuff. I and mean, we just... And then people can edit it and change it for their own. But like, like we do a PowerPoint on mower blades. You know, how do you know when they're ready? It's a little crazy for us, but in, in our world, it's a big deal. And it's, man, our maintenance cost has gone down tremendously. Our downtime is down tremendously. Well, everybody's on the same page. Everybody's, what frustrates and makes people, you know, morale go down is, I thought we were, nobody changes the blades or, you know, I picked up this weed eater and it doesn't work. And the last person who used it was like, it worked fine for me, right? Nobody's accountable. And so this has really helped accountability. So tell us about your conferences that you have. And I know that you also work with small businesses to, with Landscape University, right? We do. There's a couple of things. The university has been very, very kind to let me do things on the side as well. And I don't do a lot, but I do a few with companies who really want to change their, or promote and create a great culture. And they're looking for maybe something like Landscape U. We've created, I've worked with several companies to create real estate university, construction university, but it's all about creating it to their program. I'm not real good with working with companies who just want to overnight fix. That's not real. And so, and it's people who want to invest in their people, who value their people. And so that's, for me, it's legacy for me here at Ole Miss is what's my legacy. You know, if I'm laying there one day and they're about to put me under, you know, for eternity there and I'm about to be gone, what's that one guy going to say about me? He's going to say, man, I'm a better dad because of, you know, some of the things that they did because of Jeff. And so that's that legacy. And so I want to help people who want to create that legacy with their teams and you know, make a lot of money in the meantime too, you know, and be very productive. And you know, all those things are important. Companies have to make money to be sustainable. And yeah, you're talking my language, highly profitable, great places to work. What's better than creating that? <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> with the right people who want to invest in their teams. So what does that look like if a business owner wanted to reach out to you for that kind of help and support? How, what would you be yeah. doing? I do a couple of ways. I do uh, conferences and those are, we just got through doing one last week, which was a lot of fun. I had some great, great people here at Ole Miss. I do the conferences here. Other companies have brought me in. That's a little bit at a higher level. And then we'll, I'll work with their staff. I actually will do things on Zoom as well. We do things. I'm doing some stuff with some other companies right now with Zoom. So, you know, it's just different venues on that. Typically, you're looking at a year commitment of where we're going to do some things initially up front. But then the, I'm like the trainer in the weight room. I want to know that you're going to show up, right? I want to know the work's being done. And so there's penalties when you don't do the work. Like you have to buy me Chick-fil-A coupons, you know, gift cards when you don't do the work, right? So Okay, you know, I'm getting a little smart here. So clients, uh, you know, when yeah. you're following through on your commitments, it's going to be some gift cards. To <laughs> $25 gift card to Chick-fil-A if you don't have this assignment done. And you know this, I just had a great conversation with a great company in Virginia yesterday and they were like, you know, we did not have time to do it, and we could have sat there and made the excuses, but we just got it done. And I was like, dude, I'm so proud of y'all. You got it done. You adapt and overcome. And what we find in creating these culture is there's a lot of work up front and getting the momentum, getting the ball, but then it's just it's steady. And that's why I'm so blessed to have good bosses who understand it, that when I do this, I'm promoting what Ole Miss does and that's creating these great cultures. And so they let me do it because our culture is going really strong. It's going really well. I know that you have a gift that you want to share with our listeners and I'm really excited about it. It is a tip sheet with 21 ways to walk your team in wisdom. Yeah, so a big part of our success has been, you know, changing the mindset of our team, growing them. And think about this. Who do you want your kids to hang around with? Do you want them to hang around, you know, the potheads, the alcoholics, you know, the druggies at school? Of course not. 
right? And so there was Solomon wrote years ago that wise people hang out with wise people and fools. When you hang out with fools, you know, you become foolish. And so with this challenge was for me is, can I get my staff to hang out with wise people? And so one of the cool things we did, and this is one of the tips that I have on there, and it didn't cost a whole lot, just a little time, but I took them to the local library. You know, if you wanted to get a membership, you could. But my whole point was is so they'd get audio books, right? Books on CDs, and they would listen to them in the car because nobody has time to read, right? Or we just have, we're so busy. And I love audio books. And I didn't want the thing, well, I can't afford them. So I just showed them another free resource. Well, one of my most challenging team players bought into this. I mean, he just listening to all these things. And a couple of years ago, I asked him, I'm like, dude, I'm noticing some changes in you. And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, I listen to a lot of audio books. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, I said, well, what do you listen to right now? And he's like, he goes, I'm listening to Phil Jackson's, one of Phil Jackson's book about, champ, you know, Phil Jackson coached Michael Jordan and all these guys. And he's like, the book's incredible. It's talking about championships and all this stuff. And I'm going, right? You can have a person walking with Phil Jackson down the road in their ears. That's a win, right? How do you get them to hang around with champions? Well, you got to show them. You got to help them because most of us didn't grow up. I was fortunate that my dad, every time we were working on doing something, he had the tape recorder going and there was Zig Ziglar playing or there was a pastor preaching or there was something. So that became a part of my DNA. I just love to listen to audio, right? I'm in the truck. I'm listening to something, you know, right now I'm re-listening to Rich Dad, Poor Dad right now. And so Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill, always great books, but exposing our team to some of this because I want them to be successful. And, you know, there's the lights are turning on for a lot of guys. They're having, they're starting savings plans outside the university that are compounding, like taking 10 bucks out of their paycheck every pay period. And they see in 30 years, you know, they're going to have a nice little nest egg. You know, and then do they even want to go beyond working here? Do they want to go somewhere else? You know, and we have a lot of guys who've done that and they tell us, hey, the things I learned here, that's what got me that next job, that next raise. And somebody goes, well, you see, that's why we don't train because they're just going to leave you. I'm like, really? So you don't want a trained employee. You just want an untrained employee. We want them to be the success that they want to be, whether it's with us. And that's one of our bylines. If, if you don't like doing this, man, find something you love doing because we want people with passion. We want people who love what they do doing this, cleaning up those dead dogs, you know, weed eating that, you know, nasty stuff, dealing with the ticks because this is what we do. We create national championships. We've won five national awards. We call them national championships. And it's because of the hard work, smart work, people like us. I'm so aware of mindset with team members. And so many of our team members in small businesses come in with something called fixed mindset. And fixed mindset is that way of thinking that things are the way they are. I don't have much control over my circumstances. And introducing them to a growth mindset, which Jeff, I mean, clearly you're all about growth mindset. <laughs> it's, it's in everything you've said. But just bringing that to their attention, and it's Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, where she has a diagram that shows the difference between fixed mindset and growth mindset. And once people learn about that and they start to see in themselves, oh, right now I'm operating from a fixed mindset, or oh, that's I'm starting to think from a growth mindset. It's very powerful. And the people that we surround ourselves with, we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. And so if you're listening to audiobooks and maybe in your home environment and your friend network, you don't have really great role models and mentors. But if you're walking around listening to audiobooks, now you've upped your game with your five people or podcasts like Profit by Design podcast. <laughs> you know, that's a great way for your team members to be doing that and for you to be encouraging that. So I'm curious, what are some of the favorite books from your team members on audio? Do you track that or? I really haven't tracked it as far as what they're on their audio. I, I just always like to think that they're listening to it. There's a few guys that I ask from time to time, but I mean, we've gone through well over 30 books here, just doing training here. And what I try to do is buy everybody a book. There is no pressure to read it. But we'll meet once a month in our lead, we call it leader to leader class. And if I can get a DVD to tie in with it, 
and with that book. So in case they didn't read it, they can still watch the DVD, right? And we have that experience together. And if you have those experiences, it, it helps with your beliefs. And when the beliefs change, your actions change, which give you better results, right? So it's the four, four step formula, experience, beliefs, action, and results. That's what we're always following and doing that. So the point of the books is to create those experiences. So we've read a lot of different, John Maxwell is probably one of my favorites, Bob, just because he has made a, a easy kit that's easy. So DVD, workbook, Jeff doesn't have to prep a lot and I can just do it, put it in front, and there are lessons there. As I'm listening to it, I can think of even more questions to ask our team. And if you start doing this, the word of wisdom I would offer is, is don't expect your team just to jump into this right away. If you're all of a sudden doing this, they need to know that they can trust you and trust the environment because things come up and they need to know that it's a safe place. So I always do icebreakers to try to get people loosened up and get them used to talking because all of a sudden we're sitting down. You know, we're not out there mowing. We're not out there planting plants. We're sitting down in a little conference room talking. And this is different. So now we've been doing this six, seven years now. It's this old hat with the older guys, but the new guys, when they come in, you got to remember, you know, who's, what are they going to say and how vulnerable can I be? Right. And so, yeah. Yeah, the trust factor is huge with something like that. You know, one of my favorite books is Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Dr. Marilee Adams. I don't know if you've encountered that one, Jeff. It's not a lot of people have heard about it. I encountered it in my own coach training, and it made me highly aware of how we have these non-conscious questions that run through our minds whenever we encounter a situation. And a lot of those questions are judgmental, like, Whose fault is it? Why are they so stupid? You know, and a lot of it comes from fixed minds. And so change your questions, change your life has tools to help you shift from judger questions to learner questions. So it gets that learner mindset going. And there's a really cool PDF that comes with it called the voice map. And a lot of our business owners will print that off and put it in their conference rooms and they teach their teams about it. We teach it in our coach approach and leadership boot camp training that we do but it's one that really resonates. So that might be something. Yeah, that's a great one. Thanks for mentioning it. Absolutely. So let's get back to your PDF here with the 21 ways to walk your team in wisdom. How do our listeners get a hold of that? It's super simple. Just text 44222 and type in wisdom 2019, one word. So if you text 44222, Type in the word wisdom 2019, no spaces. Yeah, great. And I want to share another resource for our listeners. You heard Jeff talk about finding a little clip or a DVD that you can use to kick off discussion. Jeff has an excellent TED Talk. What's the title of your TED Talk? Growing Weeders into Leaders. Growing Weeders into Leaders, same as the title of the book. And that's another a great one that you might share with your team to just kick off discussion. And another shout out about Growing Weeders into Leaders is that it's an enjoyable, easy read. And so if you have team members who may not like reading, I think this is one of those books that's really easy for them to get into. And I guess that you have it on audio, right? I'm working on it. That's a goal. I know. I, it's hard for me. I haven't gotten my books on audio either. It's a little yeah. extra work. Yeah, I get beat up about that because I'm such an audio guy. So, yeah, I got to do it. We're giving you a little extra nudge here That's on the it. Profit by Design podcast. Jeff, I so appreciate you being here with us and what you've shared with myself and our listeners. It's I've learned a lot. And I'm really curious to hear feedback from our profit designers who are listening. What are you taking away? What nuggets? I know there's been a lot of nuggets in today's episode, but what are you taking away from today that you are going to put into action and use right away? Because everything here is actionable, easy to implement. So thanks again, Jeff. Sabrina, thanks for having me and all the best to you. Thank you for what you're doing. We need people like you, what you're doing in the front line. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for spending time with us today. Join our conversation in the Profit by Design podcast Facebook group. Share your thoughts on today's episode, ask us questions, and let us know what you want to hear about next. Visit our website at profitbydesignpodcast.com 
to access resources from our sponsors and tools we've created for you. Subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening to right now. There's a subscribe button right there. Go ahead and hit it so that you always get a notification when we release a new episode. And finally, share our podcast with a friend if you know a friend who would enjoy it. Thanks again for listening. This is Real Life Business. Keep your chin up. Keep moving forward. You got this.